Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us for another Teleaquarium presentation. My name is Darren, and I'm here at the Alaska Sea Life Center in our Discovery Classroom. Today, we're going to be talking about some of the more mysterious animals that we have here in Alaska's oceans. They are invertebrates. And I'm just going to touch on a few, because invertebrates really outnumber vertebrates by far. Uh, an invertebrate animal is, of course, an animal without a backbone. So uh, where we have a skeleton with a spinal cord running down through the middle of our uh, vertebrae, these animals are not going to have that. They will have other structures, other adaptations that are going to help them survive out there. But they are so numerous, so diverse, we can really only scratch the surface today. Uh, so I'm going to focus on three basic groups of marine invertebrates, and uh, some of these would be found on land and some would not as well. We're going to talk about arthropods, not with that marker. We're going to talk about arthropods, we'll talk about echinoderms, and we will look at Cnidaria. Cnidaria has a silent C at the beginning. It's really hard to talk and write at the same time, it turns out. All right, so we've got arthropods, echinoderms, and Cnidaria. So <clears throat> as we discuss those three groups, I'm going to focus on just a couple of basic things about their biology, about their anatomy. And one is going to be Symmetry. So symmetry is just whether or not something is, uh, has sort of a regular shape, the same on, um, in different directions. So, boy, our markers are just failing today. Let's try the red one here. Symmetry can be either bilateral, which means two-sided, and that's like us. There's a left and a right. Or we could have radial symmetry, which means it radiates from the center, or it comes outward from the center. So this would be something like a bicycle wheel. That would be radially symmetric, because if I start in the center, and go outward in any direction, it looks the same. So each of these groups of invertebrates is going to have a specific type of symmetry. We're going to start with the arthropods. And these are going to include animals like crabs and shrimp. So let me give you a couple of examples of these animals here at the Alaska Sea Life Center. Now this is a king crab, a red king crab, and the red king crab is the largest crab we have here at the Alaska Sea Life Center, the largest crab in the world, but close. And you can see it is sort of armored all over the outside of its body. The crab has what is called an exoskeleton, and the crab's exoskeleton is basically, you can think of it like a hardened skin. And that's what helps to protect uh, its body. It also gives it structure, just like our skeleton, but theirs is on the outside. The interesting thing about exoskeletons, though, is they cannot grow. They have to be replaced. So just like we will outgrow our clothes, these animals will outgrow their exoskeleton. And when they do that, when they outgrow their exoskeleton, in order to grow, they have to molt, which means to shed their exoskeleton. And it's kind of fascinating, but if you look at a piece of crab leg here, this is from a red king crab, we can see right through it. It's completely hollow. That's because this is from a molt. So the crab is gone, but the exoskeleton remains. And you can find exoskeletons, uh, they're just called molts. You can find crab molts 
all over the beaches uh, because they're just empty exoskeletons and they'll wash up on shore. Where did the crabs go? Fascinating story. Uh, in order to molt, these animals sort of swell up their body and they're going to crawl out of their old exoskeleton. So I'm going to show you what that looks like with a king crab. Give me just a moment here. And we're watching this sped up quite a bit. We'll let it play through a couple times here, depending on the speed. But you see this red king crab has kind of swollen its body and is now pushing itself backwards out of its exoskeleton. Legs, eyes, antenna, everything come right out. So on the right now, we have an empty molt. And on the left, we have the crab. Now, the crab is currently what we'd call soft-shelled. So if you've ever heard of soft-shelled crab that people like to eat, that is just simply a crab that has very recently molted until the new exoskeleton hardens, which we usually give a full week for for our king crabs, but within a few days it would be pretty firm. Until that new exoskeleton hardens, the crab is soft and vulnerable, so they need to find a good hiding place. Here at the Alaska Sea Life Center, We'll manage that by uh, removing the crab to a separate tank uh, or covering it with basically a little cage that will prevent other animals from attacking it while it's soft. And you can see that exoskeleton on the right, it's totally empty. That is a molt, a crab molt. So arthropods must molt in order to grow. They have an exoskeleton. Uh, and you probably have noticed already, our crabs have a left and a right side. So that is going to be bilateral symmetry. So our arthropods are bilateral. Meaning they have a left and a right side. Now another example of an arthropod here in the ocean. Oops, sorry. Another example of an arthropod here in the ocean is going to be a shrimp. And so here we've got a spot prawn in one of our habitats. The spot prawn is a pretty spry little creature. Sometimes they simply sit. Uh, other times they can really get up and move. And they can actually swim a bit uh, if they need to. But <clears throat> uh, they tend to kind of hang out down there on the bottom. But you will occasionally see shrimp uh, like the spot prawn, sort of scurrying through the water almost is what it looks like, uh, the way that they swim. They have these little uh, swimming appendages underneath their abdomen. <clears throat> if a shrimp really needs to move fast, for example, if an octopus were coming after it, the shrimp will flick its tail and shoot in the opposite direction. So uh, the uh, shrimp, a little different from the crab. The crab has sort of a stout body, kind of roundish in the middle. Um, and its tail is folded up underneath it, but the shrimp has that elongated back end that allows it to really get a lot of force with that tail. Its long, slender body makes it move even faster, and so shrimp have a quick getaway mechanism. Crabs tend to have a more tough, uh, thicker, harder exoskeleton that helps to protect them from predators. Shrimp, they do have an exoskeleton. They have to molt it in order to grow, just like those crabs. But the exoskeleton of a shrimp is a lot more sort of thin and flexible. Um, and so they have that quick getaway mechanism that helps them to survive. All right, so crabs and shrimp are examples of arthropods. And a couple of basic features of the arthropods are they have bilateral symmetry. So they're two-sided, have a left and a right. And they have that exoskeleton, which they must molt in order to grow. Land-based uh, examples of arthropods would be all of your insects. Arachnids, like spiders and mites, um, scorpions, those are all arthropods as well. The meaning of the word arthropod is jointed legs. So these animals have physical joints, which would not really be possible without that exoskeleton if they were just all floppy. Uh, let's check out our next group now, the echinoderms. And echinoderms are going to be animals like sea stars and anemones. So let's take a look first at 
or sorry, echinoderms are going to be example of animals like sea stars and urchins. Let's take a look at a couple of sea stars first. Here we have a few of our sea stars in the touch pool. Those of you who have come to visit us, you probably uh, had the experience of touching these animals, of course. On the left, we have a true star. In the middle, we have a small leather star. And over on the right, a couple of fish catching stars. Now, down here, that big orange one is another larger leather star. And here in the center, we have a sunflower star. You notice the sunflower star has a lot of arms. We're going to count them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen arms on that sunflower star. To My goodness. Arms. Here some of the biggest sea stars. I thought sea stars just had five arms, right? But it turns out five is the most common number of arms for sea stars. But some of them can have many, many more. Up to 24 arms for uh, the sunflower sea stars, in fact. And as those sea stars continue to grow, they just add arms. So as that sunflower star gets bigger and bigger, there will be a new little arm growing in between some of the original ones. So they continue to add arms. They start out with five, and then as they grow, they add more. Not all sea stars do that. Many of them just have one number of arms, and they stay that way. Some of them could have five arms. Some of them typically only have six arms. There are some that have anywhere from eight to 14, and the sunflower stars are kind of unique in that they continue adding. Sunflower stars are some of the biggest stars in the world. They can get to be the size of a huge pizza, about three feet across. And they're also some of the fastest sea stars in the world, which doesn't sound like much, does it? Uh, sea stars are typically very slow-moving creatures. Uh, this would be a sunflower star at the races. That's about as fast as they can move, which is pretty quick. Considering the way that they move, is using thousands of tiny, sticky uh, appendages called tube feet on the underside of their body. We're going to take a look at the underside of a sea star. Uh, again, with, from the group the echinoderms. And let's see what we can see on the underside of the sea star. There you can see there's that tiny new little arm growing out at the top. Small and in the very center, new arm you see to grow right uh, there. there is the other, an right? opening. That's Same. where the mouth of the sea star is. Yeah. And if you look really closely, you'll actually see a small kind of gelatinous area around that mouth. That's actually the stomach of the sea star. All around that, all on the underside of those arms, you can see all those thousands of tube feet sticky tube that they use to move. Now, <clears throat> the way sea stars eat is interesting. We, we noted that we could see that stomach just all around the mouth there. Because these creatures are very slow, the way that they often eat is simply by crawling over the top of their food and sending their stomach out of their body to wrap around their prey and <clears throat> consume their prey outside of their body. So the image that you're looking at right now is actually a sea star's stomach. And the reason why it looks kind of odd is because the sea star is on one side of a panel that has just some little slots in it. And the sea star has opened up its stomach and sent it through one of those little slots uh, in that <coughs> opening in the wall. And you're seeing the stomach. It just looks like a sort of clear gelatinous blob when their stomach comes out. And uh, Alex, I see, uh, how hollow is the molt? I just noticed your questions there. It is completely clean on the inside. Uh, it's very difficult to see, but let me go back to that molt here and see if I can get a good image looking right through the center of it with my camera. There we go. So to answer your question, how hollow is that molt? Totally. The sides of that shell are completely clean. And if you're ever wondering if you find uh, what looks like a crab on the beach, and it's not moving, <laughs> if you grab it by the top and just lift it up and it falls open, it is a molt. Uh, the big difference between a molt and a dead crab, let's say, is the dead crab will be really smelly, 
but the molt will not because it's just an empty exoskeleton. There's really not much of any tissue inside there. Eventually it will break down, but it's not going to rot like the muscle tissue and the inner organs of the crab would. Uh, so that's an easy way to tell the difference between a, what is actually a dead crab and what is simply a molt. By far, most of what you will find out there if it looks like a crab is simply a crab molt, and it is very clean on the inside. Uh, it's not to say that I would eat my cereal out of it, but perhaps you could. All right, uh, and you had another question. How many species of sea stars are in Alaska? I'm actually not sure the exact number, but there are um, at least several dozen. Um, there's some basic varieties of sea stars that differ quite a bit, and um, there are many varieties of each of those, and so definitely into the dozens when you're looking at sea stars in Alaska. All right, well that brings us to our last invertebrate group, the Cnidaria with the silent sea. And <clears throat> to explore those, let's think first about the symmetry of these animals. These animals are shaped very much like the echinoderms. And so radiating from the center of a sea star or a cnidarian, it would be simply like a circle. And so we have radial symmetry on the cnidarians. Now we're going to take a look at some swimming cnidarians first. There we go. These are moon jellies. And the moon jellies are a pretty common cnidarian in this area. We often see them uh, up near the surface. They don't need to be near the surface necessarily, but that is probably the most common place that you would see them. And you can see there the four sort of almost horseshoe-like uh, organs in the center. Those are their stomachs, and the color of the food that you can see there, uh, those are actually brine shrimp, uh, also known as sea monkeys. That's what we feed our moon jellies here. <coughs> and uh, you can see those accumulating in the stomach of the moon jellies. So their bodies are made mostly of water, almost exclusively. And uh, with that, you can actually see through many jellies because they are something like 98% water. Now another example of a cnidarian would be a sea anemone. And sea anemones are very similar to jellies, but instead of just having this sort of free swimming body, anemones are anchored to the bottom and they have a muscular foot that attaches them to the rock. And then up here in the top, we have just a little mouth, and then those tentacles coming out around the outside. Now, a common feature of the cnidarians is that they have stinging tentacles. So those of you who had the, have had the experience of reaching into our touch pool here at the Alaska Sea Life Center, uh, you know the tentacles of the anemones are uh, sometimes very sticky. They'll actually kind of attach to your fingers. We don't feel the sting of the anemones that we have in our touch pool because the ones that we have in there are not super strong. But there are many cnidarians out there uh, that can be very, very powerful, very dangerous. Uh, some are even dead. So those stinging cells inside their tentacles are what help them to capture their prey. Uh, the things that you feel sticking to you are little tiny barbs. As those stinging cells fire out, they have little microscopic barbs on them that anchor themselves into their prey, and that's what helps them to pull their prey into their mouth. So those cnidarians are radially symmetric, just like the echinoderms, uh, the sea stars, the urchins. And like I said, uh, we're really just scratching the surface today, but um, I wanted to give you a brief introduction to those three groups of ocean invertebrates. There are many more out there. Uh, we would love for you to come and visit the Alaska Sea Life Center when you have a chance to get your hands onto some of these in our touch pool and uh, explore them. 
and learn about more of those fascinating marine invertebrates out there until we get that chance. Thanks again for joining me today and learning a little bit about these invertebrates out there. And uh, if you're interested in helping to support the mission of the Alaska Sea Life Center, you'll notice in the comments uh, in the description of this video, there is Uh, a link to a donation page on our uh, website and every little bit helps to keep programs like this going but also to keep those animals healthy and help us take care of those animals and teach others about them. So thanks again for joining me today. I uh, hope you enjoyed this program and we will see you again soon on another episode of Tell Aquarium. Take care.